Vikings Raid and Conquer is not just a great game. It is, in my opinion, one of the best competitive deck building games employing the classic mechanic. I stress, classic mechanic. Copyright laws unfortunately only protect an author's expression in literary, artistic, or musical form. It does not protect the rules of a game. And after the release of Dominion in 2008, and its subsequent towering success, it was mere months before the development of imitators, many replicating the deck-building mechanics verbatim. The nearly universal quality of all deck-building involves each player receiving identical starting cards. Most are currency, employed to acquire better cards. The others are not as good, and prove an annoyance when appearing in hand. In Dominion, these are point cards required to win, but early on their inclusion is a nuisance. Players can purchase cards from available randomized stacks distributed at the beginning of the game. The objective involves creating an efficient deck to facilitate enough revenue to acquire more expensive point cards. Dominion's flaw, at least within its basic set, is a lack of player interaction. It is quite possibly one of the most boring games you can ever watch. Early imitators would only marginally alter these rules, often forgetting the greatest flaw in deck building games. Overt randomness. With Dominion, although stack selection is random, they're all always available to each player, leaving said randomness to each player's deck shuffle. As other games experimented with um, alterations to these basic mechanics, many inadvertently increased the number of variables, consequently decreasing the impact of player skill. The more random the game, the more that randomness determines who wins. A noteworthy example that commits this sin is a game I've spent a surprising amount of time and money on. Star Realms. I even backed their recent Kickstarter. Star Realms keeps the starting deck configuration the same as Dominion. Instead of low point cards occupying the junk, we have nearly equally useless Viper cards. The big change involves the fixed stacks being replaced by a popular and frequently imitated rotating flop of five cards. Another variable. Combining the flop with a random hand can result in a game swinging to one player's favor before any strategy can be implemented. What became frustrating is that further additions to the game, such as gambits, further increased this randomness. Ascension, a predecessor to Star Realms, addressed this better by not having players attack each other. Instead, they competed for points that come via monsters that emerge on the flop, but also from points on the cards purchased as well. There's still an issue, though, with the replenished flop in competitive games, though not so much in cooperative ones, where a player down on his luck can be supported by other players, and why the mechanic works well in games like Legendary and Harry Potter Battle for Hogwarts. Xenoshift returned to fixed tax, as did Paperback, two games I have a fondness for. If variables in a game can be mitigated or have their impact lessened by player actions, they can still find a place in a competitive game. Recently, some games have taken huge tangents from the base formula, such as Super Motherload, which is another awesome game. But reaching back to this base concept, shuffle starter decks, the drawing of a hand, players purchasing more cards from either fixed stacks or, or a replenished flop, there is the potential roadblock of players feeling worthless on his or her turn because these shuffle gods determined it so. And this game fixes that. Uh, no. That's, uh, that's, that's Snorlax. Um, Nicole? Baby? Vikings Raid and Conquer. A new game, you assume? Nope, you've probably just never heard of it. Right out of the gate, it's understandable to see why, leading me to my solitary complaint regarding Vikings Raid and Conquer. It's intellectual property. I would not be the only one that would dismiss this game as a cheap product tie-in like the Minecraft card game or all Monopoly spin-offs ever made. And the property in question... Seriously, I had to check to see if this show was still on the air. Four seasons so far, 40 episodes. I mean, did you know that? You didn't because I was lying. It's actually six seasons and 59 episodes. The irony is that despite being apathetic to the theme, it fits more with the deck building formula than Star Realms or Dominion. Like all the aforementioned deck building games, Vikings involves a starting deck 
of 10 cards, 8 coin cards, and 2 longbow cards. And unlike vipers, these are not useless. In fact, it's the coin cards you'll try to get rid of first. Longbolts you're unlikely ever to remove as they're required for a later stage in the game. There's a board, a draw pile, and the familiar flop of five. And where Ascension features three fixed stacks of mystics, heavy infantry, and cultists, Vikings offers warriors, hack silvers, and longboats. However, instead of placing the monsters within the flop like Ascension, the opponent's players fight over, called raid cards, are displayed above in their own five card flop. There's also basic treasure and coin cards as well. Pretty much standard fare. So where does one find innovation? With these shields, which I'll get to in 103 words. The first phase, the winter phase, replicates the traditional passive opening rounds of any deck builder. Four turns are performed where players can do nothing but purchase cards. Innovation one, all starting cards offer monetary value. No one gets hampered by a bad opening hand. On the surface, all cards respect the standard convention. You gain cards, remove cards from your hand or discard pile. More expensive cards offer increased values of power or silver. Once the last round of winter finishes, we move on to spring, where the rest of the game takes place. And then the game becomes amazing, which is when we reveal Innovation 2, the shields. Each player draws his or her hand. From there, you'll be able to assess your capacities that turn. You then commit your secret action on your shield via this action marker. Your character also has a list of defense value and base attack, but these are the same for everyone. The characters themselves don't matter, it's the ring of actions that do. Now, clockwise, each player carries out a turn as normal, though leaving cards played on the, de de on the tabletop. Shields are then revealed and the actions carried out. If you boast significant hitting power, along with at least one longboat, you can go on a raid party. You can invite others to accompany you, not raiding themselves, but if multiple players selected this, it falls to the one with the higher influence. Each player must possess a longboat, but if one player features more than one, they can share. The total power is added and the leading player can select one raid target to claim if its defense value is equal or less to your power. Each player then also claims a treasure card, which is also good for points. Raid cards are not placed in the deck. That player also becomes the Earl, equating the first player marker. Selecting Lone Raid allows you to go on a raid by yourself, still requiring a longboat, mind you. Once again, only one player can do so, though this time it's the highest power value that gains the action with influence breaking ties. The rest follows as with Raid Party. Selecting one of the other players allows you to attack that player. This does not require a longboat, and if your power supersedes the opponent's defense, you gain a treasure and can steal a card from their discard pile or from atop their draw pile. Unless there's a betray, in which case you're stuck taking that one. The defender can increase his or her defense by having taken the defend action, which adds your total power onto your defense. Now, about that defend action, you may think drawing a hand of low power cards and coin cards would make a player useless on a turn. But not only does the defend action offer protection, but it also allows you to set aside or bury one of your currency cards, including the more expensive hack silver or treasure cards. When they reach the desired value, you don't need to raid. You can just purchase a raid card directly with the buried currency. Coin cards are sacrificed. Treasure cards are returned to your deck and you still gain a treasure card for doing this. Regardless of the number of treasure cards acquired, the game ends when a player gains their fifth card and final points are tallied. The secret action is amazing and addresses many of the issues one may have regarding the randomness of deck building. Upon drawing your hand, you can immediately alter your strategy that turn. Without longboats, you can't commit to a raid, but you can certainly attack another player or defend and bury money for a future raid card purchase. Higher power with low influence will point you to a lone raid, though a higher influence would encourage a raid party. There are specific keywords as well, but we'll skip those to save time. Outside of cooperative deck building, Vikings Raid and Conquer is more thematically connected and better designed than many of the other popular competitive deck builders on the market. 
There's never a bad hand. Removing cards from your deck is easy. And there are multiple ways to acquire points. The rulebook for Vikings mentions both team play and cooperative, but does not detail them. As of their last update a few months ago, these rules have yet to materialize. High Roller Games have also announced a supplement that updates the setting to match the current state of the TV series, as well as adding in more cards and rules. But until then, cooperative. Uh, this variation doesn't require much, and High Roller Games may ultimately take their game in a different direction. But for now, this is my idea, borrowed from Legendary. In that game, villain cards begin on one side of the flop and shift to the other side. Raid cards work likewise, beginning with the first spring phase. At the end of each turn, the cards shift and a new one added. Additionally, as this game is limited to a four-player maximum, the fifth shield functions as the villain's action. Without looking, select one action. At the end of the round, the action is revealed. If a defend, all raid cards increase their defense by seven. If a specific character, that character is attacked with a power equal to the lowest defense value on the raid board. If higher, the player must sacrifice one random card from his or her discard pile or the top card from his or her draw deck. If a lone raid, the lowest card is discarded. The flop shifts to fill that spot and another raid card is revealed. If a raid party, all players can only draw four cards on their next turn. And unlike the traditional game, the selection here does not uh, counter or can be contested by another player selecting that same action. Now, if the action marker touches two, then both must be completed. If six raid cards are pushed off the flop, the players have lost. If the players have acquired six raid cards, plus one for each player, so four players is ten cards, then be before then, then they have won. To adjust difficulty, you can remove level 1 raid cards for a harder game, or level 4 and 5 for an easier one. Vikings Raid and Conquer can't and does not wish to compete with the great cooperative deck builders like Legendary, and is too thematically distinct from non-aggressive deck builders like Dominion and Paperback. But against a more popular game like Star Realms, ignoring production design or reputation, Viking beats it hands down. A perfect example of an underappreciated gem worth seeking out. Plus, I heard their expansion will be replacing production photos with art, so count me in. This is Chris from DSX Machina. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews, as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.